bitterness increased. The rage boiled over. At Dinan, General von Hausen's Saxons shot over 600 men, women and children, among them a child three weeks old. A staff officer questioned how this deed would look in history. Von Hausen said, we shall write the history ourselves. More of it was written at Louvain on August the 25th. On that day began the sack of this ancient Belgian university town. Louvain Library had been founded in 1426. Among its 230,000 volumes were 750 medieval manuscripts and over a thousand of the earliest printed books. All were reduced to ashes. A German officer watching it happen told an American correspondent, We shall wipe it out. Not one stone will stand upon another, not one, I tell you. We will teach them to respect Germany. For generations, people will come here to see what we have done. The sense of outrage grew on both sides of the line. Over the neat brick towns and the clean white farms of Belgium, the war flowed westward. The last of the French armies, General Lanzac's fifth army, facing the swinging end of Schlieffen's flail, edged slowly to its left, constantly sensing the pressure of the German right. As the 5th Army approached Namur and Charleroi, lining up along the river Sambre, the fighting swelled to a roar all the way down the line into Alsace. And now another element was coming into play, the British Expeditionary Force. For once in British history, an army was taking the field with incredible efficiency. At all the depot towns and barracks, there was tremendous activity. 60% of these men were reservists, summoned back to the colors by telegram, by public notice, even by town crier. Uniforms and rifles were issued, kits were made up, transport was prepared. New boots were fitted to feet which had lost the feel of hard army leather. 1,800 special trains carried the British Expeditionary Force to its ports of embarkation. On one day alone, 80 trains ran into Southampton docks. An average of 50,000 tons of shipping per day, safe and unhindered under the protection of the Royal Navy, carried the expeditionary force to France. Landings began in deep secrecy on August the 7th. The commander-in-chief of this army was Field Marshal Sir John French. Peppery, emotional, a good cavalry tactician, but not an intellectual soldier, French's task in those closing days of August was difficult enough to tax a genius. Sir John French believed that he was about to take part in a vast Allied advance to the Rhine. Of what had happened to the French, or of what the Germans were doing, he knew nothing. The first thing he had to do was to make contact with the French general on his right. General Lanzac. News had just come in that the German armies were making for a place on the Meuse called Huy, H-U-Y. It's a very difficult word to pronounce in English. And uh, Finch started off gallantly in French. Lieutenant Lanzac and said, uh, What do you think? Qu'est-ce que vous croyez que les Allemands vont faire? Ah, what do you think the Germans are going to do at? And then he 
stuck H U Y. And uh, he just couldn't pronounce she. So uh, after a moment's hesitation, he said triumphantly, Hoy! What are the Germans going to do with Hoy? And the French said, What's he say? What's he say? And then, very rudely, Larzac turned to somebody and uh, said, Tell the field marshal the Germans have come to the mirrors to fish. It was a bad beginning. Worse was to follow. Each day, the RFC flew its reconnaissances. Some discovered nothing, but one, scouting over the battlefield of Waterloo, just south of Brussels, was more fortunate. We found the whole area completely covered with hordes of field grey uniforms and heavy stuff transport, guns, and what have you, coming towards us. In fact, it looked as though the place was alive with the Germans. The pilot landed and was rushed off to tell Sir John French what he had seen. And I showed him a map all marked out. He said, have you been over that area? And I said, yes, sir. And uh, I explained what I'd seen. And they, they were enormously interested. And, and, and then they began reading the figures that I'd estimated. Whereupon I seemed to feel that their interest faded. They seemed to look at each other and shrug their shoulders. And uh, then French turned round to me and said, now, yes, my boy, this is terribly interesting, but what, tell me all about an airplane. Uh, wh what can you do in a, when you're in these machines? Aren't they very dangerous? Are they very cold? Can you see anything? Uh, what do you do if your engine stops and all that sort of stuff? And I couldn't bring him back to Earth because obviously uh, he wasn't interested. And then I again tried, and he, he looked at me and he said, yes, this is very interesting, what you've got, but you know, our information, which of course is correct, uh, proves that uh, you really, I, I don't think uh, you could really have seen as much as you think. Well, of course, I quite understand you may imagine you have, but it, it's, it's not the case. But the French on the right knew all about this and were falling back at the very moment when the British believed that they were advancing. It was a bad moment for Lieutenant Spears, whose duty was liaison between the two armies. And I knew that the British Army was absolutely relying on this advance to complete its own movement. And uh, the position of the British Army was extremely dangerous because we believed that a couple of German army corps were moving quite unopposed round the flank of the BEF which was on the extreme left of the whole Allied line. Well, I, that is, a young officer, had come to tell, on my own responsibility, come to tell Sir John Fridge that uh, he couldn't rely on the French advance. And indeed, that if he continued advancing as he was planning to do, it was the destruction of the whole of the British Army. We were walking straight into the mouth of a trap, enormous trap. The dream of advancing through Belgium was at an end. From here onwards, it would be all harsh reality. The date was August the 22nd. The position which the army reached was the battlefield of Mons.